Perfect, you can go ahead. Great, thanks Tara. Um, so hello everyone. First, I wanna thank the Global Fund Advocates Network for hosting this space for us to be able to have this important conversation. My name is Sarah Lindsay. I'm the Global Advocacy Manager at Living Goods. And for those who don't know us, um, we're an international NGO that strengthens community health systems and supports digitally empowered community health workers in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'll be moderating the session today. We have a really great lineup of speakers. We're excited to have this conversation with you all. Over the last decade, great strides have been made um, in the fight against HIV, TB, and malaria. And many of these gains have been made at the community level. Community health workers equipped with digital health tools are reaching the most vulnerable communities at the last mile with primary health services. And community-based care is essential, particularly in highly constrained health systems in low and middle income countries. When a child is sick, a community health worker is often the first point of contact, testing for and treating malaria in their neighbor's home or referring complex or urgent cases to health clinics. We all know COVID-19 is impacting this and impacting everything. The Global Fund estimates 75% of current HIV, TB, and malaria programs are already being impacted. For vulnerable communities affected by these diseases, COVID-19 represents a fundamental threat. Not only are these communities extremely vulnerable to COVID-19 itself, but they're likely to be even more at risk of HIV, TB, and malaria. So with this current situation, digital health tools are more important than ever and the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a greater demand for digital health innovations at the community level. Community health workers can play a pivotal role in pandemic response from interrupting the virus to maintaining existing health services. And this pandemic has necessitated innovation, including revising existing case management applications and designing and deploying COVID-19 modules for contact tracing. Over the last couple of months, there's been significant digital transformation, and that's why we're here today, and that's what we're going to hear about from our panel. But before we get started, we're going to show a short video of how community health workers utilize digital health tools in the field. This video shows Juliet Saranjogi, a community health worker in Uganda, treating a family in her community. Weeks the bidet, my vega, letting enough feed on one or one. Your phone, I'm so jogger man, yes, she do. I think I'm a new band, Munzeka, the Alibin Soved. Catalan's Jukida. The shallow chap, a cooling home, sour way, child. I think a neighbor wang, and an ends look at each image. When I took a yo, name me turn a gurao. Nitukebele o mwa na na mukebele ngali na msudia kwenzi. Ata yali asema nusu sema. Na tuwa yempeke zata ndi kilwa ako. Hali nama na tuwe lekela ogena mduwa lido. Kwanza yala banga asema. Mduwa tu kama mduwa lido. Nibatete kake chupa maangu. Hilo mwa na waita wenye nakuntono na wana. Juliet <laughs> Mkasera kuna dara keshiro. Nalisi wanche ngenda kola. Juri yetu wa mungaso nyo kucharo shafi. Bye bye. 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 Ok. Mm. Great. So now that we've seen a community health worker in action during normal times, we're going to move to hear from our speakers on how digital health is being utilized to continue to deliver primary health care during COVID. Our first speaker today is Dr. Peter Kadu, 
Dr. Peters, Director of Health at Living Goods Uganda. He has expansive experience in public health program management and health system strengthening, working with hospitals, local government, HIV AIDS projects throughout Uganda. Dr. Peter is also a visiting lecturer at the International Health Sciences University in Kampala and holds an MPH from the Royal Tropical Institute in the Netherlands and a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from McCreary University. Dr. Peter, over to you. Thank you very much for um, the introduction, Sarah. And I want to start off by uh, welcoming all the participants and my fellow panelists. Um, I'll probably start by just giving a brief background about uh, uh, how we are utilizing digital health tools uh, in uh, our work uh, at the community level. As Living Goods, we support over 7,000 digitally empowered community health workers uh, across Uganda and Kenya, uh, working with governments in both countries to strengthen community health systems at all levels from uh, the national system right down to uh, the community level. Uh, and also with a focus of uh, advocating for increased financing for community health, uptake of digital tools uh, for community health workers, and strong performance management for community health workforce, as well as ensuring that communities receive the best quality of care uh, from other health workers who serve them. Um, I'll, I'll maybe focus a little bit more on Uganda. Uh, and, and thinking about uh, the three focus diseases uh, of the Global Fund, that is uh, uh, malaria, TB, and HIV. We know that Uganda is among the 20 highest burden uh, tuberculosis countries um, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, HIV as well, uh, in spite of uh, the wonderful progress that has been made in HIV mitigation and control. Uh, Uganda still has a high burden uh, of HIV uh, with about 5.7% uh, uh, of the adult population. Um, we still currently have about 1.4 million uh, people uh, who are HIV positive, uh, but very fortunately, uh, the vast majority, which is over 85%, are already on uh, antiretroviral therapy. And uh, it is also noted that uh, more than 90% of them are registering viral suppression. We also know that great success has been registered in reduction of uh, HIV AIDS related deaths uh, by up to 59% uh, from uh, 56,000 uh, in uh, 2010 uh, to approximately 23,000 uh, in 2018. And uh, it's notable that the greatest reduction in, in these deaths has been in women, uh, where deaths among women have reduced by 70%. Uh, we are also aware that uh, in the event of COVID, in the era of COVID, uh, and largely because of the mitigation measures which were instituted uh, by governments, and particularly the government of Uganda, um, uh, the freeze on public transport and the requirement uh, for somebody to have a travel permit to a health facility in the early days of the lockdown uh, led to um, um, a failure of patients uh, to access the care they needed. Uh, and uh, it is well documented that uh, some people who are living with HIV were not able to get their medicines in time. Uh, we also know that uh, Uganda is a malaria endemic country. It's actually a whole endemic country. Uh, and among the six uh, uh, highest uh, burden countries uh, in Africa. Uh, Uganda has perhaps one of the most uh, you know, prolific uh, record of malaria transmission rates on the continent. Uh, and we experience uh, about, uh, there are places where people will actually experience more than 1,500 infectious bites per year. So it is no surprise that uh, for 2020, the World Malaria Day tagline for Uganda this year was why survive COVID and die of malaria. And, and it's also on record uh, that a poor access to health facilities, again, uh, in the era of COVID uh, due to uh, some of the mitigation measures that have been put in place has led to a reduction in, in, in access to health facilities. And therein uh, comes the importance of uh, community health workers. Uh, with uh, the over 7,000 community health workers supported, uh, 5,000 of them being in Uganda, uh, Living Goods has ensured that first of all, 
uh, in the era of COVID, uh, there is maximum attention to the safety uh, of community health workers. And then there is a mitigation of uh, the potential of uh, transmission by community health workers and to community health workers of COVID. Uh, but secondly, ensuring that there is continuity of health services. Uh, to be able to do that, uh, we have ensured that um, uh, community health workers uh, who are armed with digital tools, who have a smartphone uh, and a digital health app, uh, can be able to continue providing services. Uh, we've been able to uh, see the modification of our program delivery uh, to ensure that uh, we have options of both no and low touch protocol, uh, which include uh, being able to provide remote care. Uh, that includes uh, being able to use phone calls to reach clients, uh, ensuring that uh, even when there is in-person uh, interaction between the community health worker and their community, uh, there is a social distance as uh, guided by the ministries of health and that uh, community health workers are equipped with uh, personal protective equipment, uh, as well as elimination of some of the non-essential uh, services to ensure that uh, service continuity conti happens whilst also limiting uh, the potential for spread uh, of uh, COVID. Uh, we've also ensured that um, uh, the, there, there is opt-out for community health workers with pre-existing conditions uh, because of their increased vulnerability to um, severe forms of COVID. And we've also made sure that uh, the financial barriers to accessing uh, medicines, particularly uh, malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea medicines are lim uh, uh, eliminated. So we have provided uh, malaria medicines free of charge. Uh, using uh, digital health tools, we've been able to adapt our programming uh, with the digital health tools such that uh, for every household that is reached, uh, there is COVID screening. So um, this is now really about how we can be able to ensure that uh, service delivery continuity happens even in the era of COVID. So uh, we've, been made sure, we've made sure that there is a COVID screening and referral of suspects. So all the digital workflows that we are using uh, now enable the community health worker to screen uh, the household for COVID. Uh, there is also a self-check for PPE and we are able to tell uh, right uh, in real time that a community health worker has run out of um, uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, we are also able to uh, provide a community education on COVID uh, because of, uh, uh, again, the digital tools that we've used uh, in ensuring that uh, training of community health workers happens uh, using uh, electronic uh, learning approaches, uh, as well as ensuring that uh, a messaging uh, that is founded on uh, uh, using the digital tools also continues to happen. So by and large, uh, we see that uh, digital health tools have been a key um, uh, component in ensuring that there is continuity of services, that there is integration of uh, COVID-related uh, programming, especially both the prevention, the screening, as well as the reporting. Uh, and we know that uh, with the, some of the functionality of uh, the digital tools like the, uh, the, the uh, GPS functionality, uh, this also provides uh, ease uh, for contact tracing. And, and all this has been linked to our contact tracing teams within the districts where we work. So um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm really happy to be part of this uh, discussion and I would like to uh, first stop there for now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and go through all the speakers and then do a discussion and question answer session at the end. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat box or we can also unmute and put on your video um, at the end after all the speakers. Okay, so I'm going to now move um, to Margaret O'Dara. Margaret is a community health worker and mentor at Mathari North Health Center located in her neighborhood in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, trained as a mentor under the Catholic Medical Mission Board through USAID funding, Ms. O'Dara spends her days mentoring HIV positive mothers who are either pregnant or lactating and monitoring their progress to ensure there is no transmission of HIV to mother and child until the baby is 18 months old and HIV free. 
As an HIV positive woman with an HIV negative husband and HIV negative son, Ms. Odera is a role model to all her patients on how women living with HIV can thrive and access essential health services and education to ultimately lower their HIV transmission rate to zero. Margaret, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to tell the audience a little bit about your work. Oh, we're gonna need you to unmute. Hold on one second, Margaret. All right. There, we can hear you, great. Okay, uh, my name is Margaret Odera and I'm a mental mother, as you've heard, uh, Sarah. Thank you for introducing me. I mentor HIV positive mothers who are either pregnant or lactating. And uh, uh, in, this, in this era of uh, COVID-19, it has really changed my role. Now my role has changed from, from just mentoring these HIV positive mothers to a bigger role of uh, sensitizing the community and the facility on COVID-19. So in every day I have, I have to sensitize the community and the facility. Uh, I have to take five minutes in uh, sensitizing the community about uh, the dangers that is looming on uh, COVID-19, especially in the mothers and, and in the people at large who are living with the, with the HIV since our immunity system is compromised. So I have to check uh, each and every day those who are coming to the clinic, whether they have put on their, their masks and uh, what they are lacking, maybe washing hands and uh, just uh, social distancing. So my role has really changed from a big role to a bigger role. And uh, COVID uh, is the first topic, uh, five minutes every day in the morning health talks that I use. Then another thing that uh, has changed in my role is I have to liaise with the organization like uh, the MSF and the, the chief the chiefs comes in the hospital. Uh, since uh, our hospital is limited to providing essential services, so sometimes we have to use the toll-free numbers for emergency services since we lack uh, things like ambulances in our, in our hospital, things like ICU, we don't have ventilators, so we have, I have to liaise with the organizations like uh, MSF, which is a nearby organization in Mathare slums, to just help us in case of an emergency. And then I have been a bridge between uh, community and facility in churches, just to make sure that, uh, okay, in the, in the churches and uh, even in the, with the chief's camp, I've been with uh, that bridge, just to make sure that the community, the mothers and the, the fathers and the children who are in the community have uh, enough supply of uh, face masks if they are supplied in the, in the chief's camp. And I've also been a bridge between the community and the churches because sometimes you find the churches are providing uh, nutritional services like uh, food. And uh, in this area, in this era, we are, we are really challenged. Some of the, uh, the community members don't have jobs. Some of them have lo lost uh, their jobs and their livelihood. So 50% uh, uh, of our community depends on uh, churches and just well-wishers. So I have been a bridge uh, in the chiefs camp to see if they have a, a constant supply of uh, things like masks and sanitizers. Because even in our community, we have an acute shortage of water. Just like yesterday, we didn't have water the whole day. So my, my role have really changed from a big role to a bigger role. Yeah, an effort that uh, I have made in this is that I had to take a line list of uh, 256 mothers to take their contacts or their, the contacts of their spouses so that uh, I may, we may not have uh, many, you know, you, we may not have defaulters in this era because uh, we know that uh, the dangers of defaulting in this, in this era of COVID-19, the dangers of defaulting uh, means uh, you know, fatality for us. So I have to take uh, phone numbers of the 256 mothers who are in the PMTCT and their spouses and to lie us with the TB room, with the, with the TB community health workers to take also their, their, their phone numbers so that each and every day, we, I have to make sure that I have called uh, 12, 12 clients so that in, in every two weeks, I have called to, uh, 
one, uh, 12 clients per day so that uh, in every two weeks we have a number of clients that I have mentored and uh, I have known what they are, are lacking. And then uh, another effort is to make uh, this phone call a day prior or two days prior to the, to the visit in the facility so that I may know what the, this client needs so that I may make arrangements and, uh, with, the, with the rooms if they need a, a, a immunization for the babies or the PCR or the viral load screening for the cervical cancer. So I have to call them two days prior so that when they come to the clinic, all these services are, they, she gets all these services at once so that she may stay home as, as much as possible. At this moment, we are giving, we are giving the clients ARVs for a longer period of time. For those who are not suppressed, uh, uh, the, the, two, the 2,800 members of the comprehensive, of the bigger comprehensive uh, care unit, uh, those who are not, uh, those who are virally suppressed have a, a return date of six months. But every two weeks, we have to make sure that we call them, we mentor them so that we may know how they are doing. And if they are, they are lacking any nutritional service, uh, I may know where I can chip in. So I have to make sure when this client comes to the facility, all these services are done at once. If it is immunization of the baby, the cervical cancer screening, the TB, because uh, uh, we know that this uh, in, the, in our area, in Madara North area, the prevalence of TB and cervical cancer is still very high, it's still growing, especially in, in the mothers who are HIV positive. So we have to, I have to make sure that when she comes and she has not been screened of, of cervical cancer, it is done. Yeah, and uh, uh, the challenges that we are having in the com in the facility right now is sometimes we have a lack of co uh, constant supply of the PPEs. Sometimes we don't have uh, enough uh, uh, sanitizers. We don't. So sometimes we have to, you know, struggle. And sometimes our some of the health workers have to stay at home because there is there are no enough uh, gloves. Then we have lack of ICU beds. We need a. We also need continuous uh, CME as a con uh, community health worker. We know that the COVID-19 is constantly changing. So those are the things that we are lacking at the moment. And then the psychosocial support, the mental health checkup of the of the community health worker and the mental mother also is very important. Yeah, and uh, since. Uh, if I can give an example, in the last uh, week, there was a patient in our hospital that died of COVID. So the whole crew that, that uh, took care of that patient uh, in the CCC clinic are in quarantine right now. So, uh, so we have to work extra harder to, to make sure that the few, the, the few members of the, of the CHVs that we have are able to to contain and to, to support all the clients that are coming in the, in the facility. So I think uh, that one, the, the wellness of a community health worker also, the mental health check will be very important. And to provide wellness services for the community health workers and the mental mothers. Also, sometimes we have a, we have a, a challenge at times we have a lack of, of airtime. Airtime is very scarce. So I have to dig deeper in my pocket and just uh, have uh, my own airtime. Then the digital tools that we are having right now are not so much. Uh, the doctors are still seeing the patients manually, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and the, the only, the digital tools that, that we have right now uh, are in the laboratory. The, the laboratory tools are digital. And then we have the uh, blood pressure machine, which is a uh, digital, and there are only two, uh, two main uh, digital machines in the, in the facility. So you can imagine, and the, con the congestion of the, the hospital in that slum area is, uh, uh, okay, the, the, the flow, we have a big number of people who come to the facility. Then the other digital tool that we have is a smartphone. The community health worker uh, right now is being trained by the Mothers to Mothers program. 
the mentor mothers are being trained by the Mothers to Mothers program, uh, pioneered by Dr. Charles Moruka and, um, and Emily, who are helping us and training us how to, on how to use the, the smartphones. And they have also supplied us with the digital uh, thermometer so that everywhere we go, even in the, in the, in the, in the streets, in the community, uh, everybody has this th thermometer at hand in case of anything, any temperature, any, anybody who complains in the community, I am able to take the temperature and just uh, if, if the hospital is uh, closed at night, I'm able to call 719. The, the, the MSF has a toll free. So when you call the MSF, they just come with the ambulance immediately and they, they, they transport the, the, the sick person either in a, a bigger hospital, Kenyatta or Mbagazi, because the uh, Mother Renault Health Center is, is limited to, to just uh, working during the day and only the women in labor and those who are delivering are able to come uh, on 24 hour services. But at night, we don't have any other services apart from the labor ward. Yeah, and with that, I think, um, yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Margaret, for sharing your experience. I think I speak for all of us that we're, we're really impressed and inspired by all the work you're doing and recognize the burden that, you know, COVID is putting on double, tripling your workload. So thank you for sharing that with us. I know we have a couple questions, but we're going to address those right after we hear from our last speaker, Anthony Mina. Um, Anthony is, let me, Go to his slides. Anthony is Lawala's Monitoring and Evaluation Information Systems Administrator. He is responsible for the oversight of all information systems at Lawala that relate to data collection, data management, data reporting, and strategic planning. Anthony has a bachelor's degree from Kampala International University and a Monitoring and Evaluation Certificate from AMREF International University. Anthony, I'll turn it over to you if you want to turn your video on. I see you and I have your slides queued up. So if you just want to tell me when you want to go the next slide, I can do that for you. Oh, let's unmute. Yeah. Okay, Perfect, we can hear you. I'm sure you can hear me now. Yeah, Mr. Anthony Mahina, I'm the uh, Luala m and &E Information System Administrator. Actually, I oversee all the information technology that you put in place in Loala, spanning from how we create the data collection tools and also how we collect our data, how we store our data, and also how we maintain our data integrity, and also how, very importantly, how we disseminate our data to the program implementers and also to our stakeholders. So uh, I have a presentation that would like to take you through as you also give you an overview of what Loala is all about. So if you can put that um, presentation on screen, but I cannot be able to see it. Can I share it from my end? Um, do you see it? I'm sharing my screen. Yeah, I can see your screen, but I cannot see the presentation. I'm just seeing the one that has the logo living goods, a community health worker viewport on digital health during COVID-19, and also the participants, but I'm not seeing the slide. Would there be a problem? Can I? Can I try to share from my end? Yeah, let me let me make you the co-host. Or Tara, are you able to make him the co-host? Yeah, I can do that. Just one second. Okay. Anthony, you should now be able to share your screen. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure you can be able to see to see my screen. Um, you need to uh, select what you want to share. So if you have the presentation open, you need to make sure that you've selected the presentation. Okay. Um, okay, I'll start by uh, Lola Community Alliance actually is a, is a community-led health organization which was founded by people in Migori County, just here in Kenya, 
And um, our direct service model is actually supported by four very important pillars, uh, which are community committees and also the community health workers, um, our, our health facility that, we, that we've partnered with, or rather that we support, and also uh, the data that we collect from all those areas. So this uh, model really fits very well in, uh, uh, in advancing the holistic health outcomes in Migori County. Hold on and one second, Anthony. We're still, um, we're not seeing your screen. It says you started sharing, but it doesn't seem that you've selected um, the PowerPoint. We still have a black screen. Oh, okay. Are you seeing it now? I am not. Oh. Anthony, um, I know that when Sarah um, had it up, it did work for her and the rest of us could see it. So perhaps maybe Sarah can just share it and you can just tell her when to go to the next slide and we can, we can do this on faith. <laughs> that yeah. If that, if that oh. works for you. Oh, there it is. We have it. <laughs> okay. So you are seeing it? We see it now. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So yeah, as I was saying, so this, uh, this four um, model really fits very well in our advancing holistic uh, health outcomes in Migori County and also in the areas that we are planning also to scale to because we have uh, the scaling strategy and also the expansion uh, strategy. So um, I'll start by uh, taking you through the slides that have uh, that I've created here. Uh, and the topic is data tools developed for use by LCA community health workers during the COVID-19. <clears throat> so um, we have the community health workers program, uh, which we have recruited and also trained. And also we also motivate them by giving them small stipend here and there. And also each and every community health worker is assigned a supervisor who normally oversees how the community health worker is doing its job. And also we have really uh, made sure that all the community health workers are digitally empowered because uh, we have really shunned the paper-based data collection way and we have gone the digital way. So uh, in Luala, we have a number of data systems that you've put across. And um, <clears throat> one is our mobile data collection tool, uh, which is Comcare and Comcare is actually um, developed by Dimaji. And um, we have also, we have also subscribed to our cloud-based uh, relational database, which is Salesforce. Salesforce actually is a database that allows us to be able to store all the data that's coming in from Comcare. So we have uh, integrated Comcare data collection tool uh, with our database Salesforce so that now the data which is being collected by the community health workers can get its way into Salesforce. So we have used one OpenFN data integration platform that allows us uh, to full integrate uh, Comcare and Salesforce. Again, um, we have the district health information software, that is DHIS, that uh, Loala uses to aggregate and share data with the county and the national government. And again, uh, all that data uh, we have uh, we have created a key performance indicator dashboard that will allow us to be able to store this data and also create um, different graphs for visualization and also to be able to share with the program implementers and also our stakeholders. <clears throat> this is in line with the Power Business Intelligence application that uh, we have really put up uh, in place in one for all the data visualization. But on the clinic side, we have the Kenya Electronic Medical Record System which help us to track and monitor progress of the HIV positive patients. But uh, in the near future, we are trying to work the palladium and see how we can be able to expand it uh, uh, so that we can be able also to use it to, uh, to track other uh, clinical areas apart from just HIV uh, positive patients. So um, as I've said there before, we use Comcare, uh, mobile data uh, collection platform and we've created our own application, uh, which we call Luala Mobile, uh, which is basically used by the community health workers, the supervisors also used by the clinicians at different levels. We also used it to create our own household service here and there. But uh, for this forum, I'm just going to concentrate more on what the community health workers use and also the, the supervisor. As I've said there before, um, we, uh, Comcare is actually developed by 
by the Maji and um, in different areas here and there. Luala has also uh, collaborated with the Living Goods. Uh, we have collaborated with uh, Living Goods in, uh, uh, in creating and working together on national protocols. Uh, and also being, and also we are part of the Community Health Impact Coalition, that is CHIC, and have been working across counties and also national initiatives here, here and there. So um, with, with Luala Mobile application, the community health workers are able to enter real-time tracking data on the pregnant mothers and the children who are under five and also our HIV positive clients, because these are our core areas of our programming. Uh, the app also allows the CAW to be able to receive reminders for clients who need uh, the follow-up. For example, if a certain client had, uh, had shown some signs of fever or malaria cases, so the app will actually alert the CAW that on a certain day you are supposed to follow up on this client because of this particular reason. So the application as well, uh, it has some decision support features. Uh, to identify the highest risk malnutrition and also malaria cases, just the way I work with the follow-ups again. So also, it has some forms uh, that allows the CW to pay close attention to high-risk cases such as the current pregnancies. So, uh, this is just to ensure that there's a positive health outcomes. Again, um, it also allows the community health workers to be able to track the children who are not fully immunized because uh, we all understand that all the children who are under two years old are supposed to be fully immunized. So the app will actually alert the CW that actually you have children uh, in the household that you've enrolled that are not fully immunized and you should be following up with these kind of households. Also, again, the current pregnancy is also sort of be able to show the community health worker that uh, a certain mother is pregnant and uh, you should be following up with her. Uh, just to synthesize her on the importance of antenatal clinics, ANCs here and there. So among many other, which we cannot be, I cannot be able to uh, go through in this forum. So um, in this COVID-19 pandemic, we have created the, an application which we call the COVID-19 toolkit. And um, in this COVID-19 toolkit, we have a number of uh, forms that we've created. And one is a COVID-19 facility gate screening. And also we have the COVID-19 uh, community health worker self-check, the community health worker household phone screening, COVID-19 learning resources. So this one is basically used by the community health worker, but I'll also show you another tool which is used by the supervisor, but I'll just be taking you through uh, one by one. So the COVID-19 facility gate screening, uh, this is one is done by the CAWs who are assigned to all the partner facilities, including Luala Health Facility as well, and also the other clinical personnel who are assigned to do the screening. So this one is used by uh, it's used to screen patients who are coming to the facility before they actually start receiving other uh, health facility services. So this one is done at the gate just to make sure that people who are coming into a facility they are actually free of any COVID-19 symptoms. So far, uh, we've done 34,120 uh, gate screenings, and out of that, 63% of, of the thing are completed at the Luala Community Health Center, and 37% are completed at the partner facilities. 62% uh, of patients screened are women, and 13% of patients screened are actually children under five. And we have a number of uh, suspected cases flagged by the clinical team, but we'll be showing you how those kind of uh, uh, cases are being flagged using the, uh, you, you, using the app itself. The next one is actually the, uh, the, the COVID-19 Community Health Worker Self-Check. Actually, this one is done before a CAW actually goes to, uh, uh, goes to a household to do his daily household visit. And uh, it's important uh, to remember that the self-assessment uh, result is not a diagnosis, it's actually, it's for it's just for information or purposes only. It does not qualify as a medical opinion. And that's why we normally tell the community health worker that for all medical emergencies, they should seek medical care immediately. So um, the, it has a number of questions that you have to fill in just to be sure that actually they are free and, uh, and they are not exposed to COVID. So, so far we, uh, we, we have received 16, that, uh, that's 1,638 uh, self-check that, that has been done by the community health workers, a number of uh, suspected cases flagged, uh, we have zero, and then we have a 97% of form submission 
uh, they indicate that the community house workers have all been having the PP that they need to complete their household visit. And uh, also 97% of, of them also, uh, they have reported that they routinely sanitize their tablet prior to the field work. And uh, 23 CW have cumulatively reported having a potential exposure to COVID-19 through travel or contact and were subsequently referred to their supervisors as high risk. And uh, so the 8% of CAWs were referred to their supervisor for additional support prior to field work. So counseling on how to better adhere to distancing standards, provision of additional PPE, and the classification of high risk. Uh, this is the one that are being flagged to the, to the supervisor, of which I will be showing you how the supervisor gets to understand or to know that a certain CAW actually has been exposed. And the remaining 82% were clear to proceed with the household. With this is just uh, among this is just few among so many uh, other indicators in, indicators that we track. But I saw it better to just flag these ones here. Uh, the other one is the is the community health worker household phone screening, and this one is done also prior to the CAW before visiting the household. So all the community health workers. Uh, they have the phone contact for the household that they've enrolled in their tablet or rather in Comcast. So they can be able to see all the, uh, all the contacts for, uh, for the household that they have enrolled. So here we have empowered the community health workers with uh, enough airtime so that they can be able to be calling the household uh, to find out whether we have any, uh, we have any case of, uh, of COVID-19. And this one is just actually to determine whether the visit is safe to conduct and uh, whether any member of the household uh, exhibits symptoms of COVID-19 or whether anyone in the household had traveled outside their home region within the last 14 days. So it's just to just a measure of just being safe for the CAW before actually going to visit. And so far we have received 5,000 uh, 32, 5, full screenings done since we launched this COVID-19 toolkit in June 1st, 2020. So 91% of community members who report having access to a preventive hygiene measure, uh, that is soap, uh, safe water source, surface disinfectant, hand washing, sanitizing instruction, that is, and cleaning towels. So, and uh, we have zero number of suspected cases which are flagged among the household members. So, and uh, we have 19 household reported uh, potential exposure through either travel or contact that were classified and high risk. Again, I'll be showing you whenever a household has been uh, reported as a, uh, exposed what the supervisor is supposed to do. Um, again, now here is where we have now the supervisor tools. Uh, one, we have the bi-weekly CAW supervision assessment, as, and also we have the CAW exposure list form. I, I'll be talking about the, uh, the COVID-19 training post test later. So the bi-weekly this form is used to record the interaction the supervisor actually have had with each of the CAW under his uh, supervision through the COVID-19 response deployment. So the supervisor is supposed to be filling out um, one form per CAW every two weeks during their duties uh, as a lawyer supervisor. And so uh, number of the times, yeah, is, it's where we want to know the number of times the supervisor has actually interacted with the community health worker and also the type of support he or she has been providing and whether he or she has always been adhering to the protocol when responding to various uh, scenarios. So here is, um, they would just want to know whether they've been supplying the PPEs and whether they've also been reporting an expo uh, any exposed community health worker by completing the exposure uh, risk form of which I'm going to talk about next. So the exposure risk form, uh, so unlikely, uh, unlike the biweekly CAW supervision assessment, uh, which must be submitted every two weeks per CAW, the exposure risk form only needs to be completed in the event that a CAW becomes exposed to COVID-19 during household visit or other health or other health service provision activities uh, here and there. So uh, this one is filled whenever CAW becomes exposed. Uh, so this is just. Uh, Let's call it a tracking tool for all the incidents resulting in community health worker exposure. So the kind of question there, it details, uh, it uh, asks the CW to, uh, it, it asks that, that the details of the exposure need to be uh, highlighted there, uh, not just highlighted, but deep details about the exposure and also the date of the exposure and also what kind of action uh, actually was taken uh, whenever that kind of an exposure uh, actually 
happened. So um, another uh, another form that you've created is the, is the COVID-19 training post test and also the uh, for the supervisor and also for the CW. This one uh, is just following up after the training just to see whether actually the supervisor are able now to conduct the, uh, they're able to conduct uh, or, or are they able to implement the tools? They have even understood all the questions, their intention, and also to be able to, well, so for, it's for us, the people who have trained to be able to be sure that now they are capable of implementing this COVID-19 toolkit. Uh, it's the same thing uh, also happened to the state. So we also do this post-training test to see whether now they fully understand what COVID is all about. They really understand how to implement everything. They really understand even the reason why we are doing this. You really understand how even how to navigate through this uh, app and all that. So uh, once we are sure and hundred percent sure that now this tool can be used, that's where now we um, uh, we implement it. Hi, Anthony. Um, I just want to make sure we have some time for questions. Um, can you wrap up in about thirty seconds? Yeah, this is the last one actually. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, exactly. So the last one here is where now we have embedded uh, a number of learning resources, which are video clips. Uh, is this one is introduction to COVID-19 and who is more test street and also how to stay safe. Yeah, these are just learning resources and there marks the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. That was great. It's nice to walk through all the tools that you've been using for both community health workers and supervisors. So now we're going to go to some questions that we had in the chat box. One second. Um, so the first question, and Dr. Peter, I think this would be best for you to answer, but others feel free to jump in. Um, since TB and COVID have similar symptoms, are you able to screen jointly for these diseases? And how are you addressing confusion, fear, and stigma about coughing, COVID, and TB? Um, thank you for the question. Um, uh, so, so uh, definitely, uh, TB and, and COVID do share a few symptoms, uh, particularly the fever and cough, uh, among others. Uh, but in terms of uh, uh, clinical recognition, uh, there is quite a difference between the uh, clinical case definition of COVID uh, compared to that of TB. Uh, so um, there, there are definitely many, many illnesses which will present uh, with one or two or even three of uh, all the COVID symptoms. Uh, but what sets one apart from the other is the uh, clinical case definition. Uh, so th th that is really the key distinguishing factor. And uh, TB has quite a, 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 a very you know, well-known clinical case definition, which will easily set it apart from COVID. Uh, so there is definitely uh, potential, maybe at community level uh, for confusion. And um, uh, in, in, in many communities, particularly in Uganda, there was quite some fear uh, in the initial days uh, before people began to understand what COVID was about. Uh, and very many people who had coughs were being urged to, to run to the uh, authorities to be tested. Um, but what we shouldn't, of course, um, uh, uh, forget is that uh, there is still some stigma uh, against uh, people who have uh, tuberculosis. Uh, there has also been some stigma towards people who have been suspected of COVID and even those who have recovered uh, of COVID. So the, the issue of stigma uh, continues to cut across. Uh, uh, for both diseases which have been with us for a long time, like HIV and AIDS and TB, but also uh, for even newer conditions which are still not well understood by our community, uh, our stigma is still something that needs to be mitigated. I hope that response suffices. Thank you. And I see Margaret, were you raising your hand? Did you have something to add? Oh, you're, hold on. You're muted, hold on. There you okay, go. Okay, I was just uh, supporting what you were saying about the stigma. <laughs> the stigma of COVID and the TB is very much alive even in Nairobi, yeah. 
Thanks, Margaret. And the next question we actually have is for you. Um, COVID-19 is lethal to people with underlying conditions, including HIV. What specific preventative measures do you recommend to people with HIV? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, the social distancing is very important. The nutritional, okay, uh, right now we, we used to give uh, ARVs every three months. Right now we have extended uh, ARVs. We give uh, six months uh, uh, supply for ARVs so that uh, these people can stay as far from the hospital as possible because we know the hospital is where they can even get the, the COVID-19. Another, another, another issue is about nutrition, what we eat. And, uh, you know, we have now to be steady in what we are eating and uh, not, uh, you know, jumping, you know, taking drugs. Like uh, we, 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 we have to now be very steady in a even setting time in how we are going to take our ARVs, that is very important. So I al always tell uh, my, my clients to set alarm. If it is possible to set an alarm, you take drugs. If it is 9 p.m., like the way I do, you take drugs exactly at 9 p.m. You increase your fruits in intake. And then when we are in the house, we make sure that you don't just uh, stay in one position for a long time you just uh, exercise you you know we walk around yeah and then uh psychosocial support uh, a hiv positive person especially the community health worker who is a hiv positive has to have a uh, psychosocial uh, support and if we have uh, the, this mental health checkup each and every time i think uh, it will be of a great help to us people who are living with HIV. Then another, another, another challenge is the mother and the child. You know, uh, the, you, you cannot, we cannot stay away from our children, especially my twin boys who are two and a half years old. So I have to take hygiene uh, very seriously. And, and, and I'm passing, I do pass even this message to other HIV positive uh, mothers and uh, fathers to take hygiene very seriously because uh, our immunity system is compromised. So checking on our nutrition, what we actually eat, setting time, not taking, you know, we can tell, somebody can take an ARV on a daily basis, but if I take an ARV today at 9 p.m., tomorrow I take at 10, uh, at 4 a.m. tomorrow, you know. So setting an alarm has been uh, very important at this moment and then uh, staying safe, staying in the house. If, if, if possible, you stay out of the hospital as much as possible. When a HIV positive person comes to the facility, if she's a mother, uh, I just make sure that she has as much, you know, as much, uh, you know, as, as, as much as possible to have every need that she's, every of her needs are catered for. Maybe if she comes for child immunization, I make sure that maybe if she's uh, due for PCR or viral load test uh, or, a, or a cervical cancer, it is done that very day so that she may get time out of the hospital as much as possible. Thank Thanks, you so Margaret. much. Great. And um, Dr. Peter, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, and, and thank you, Margaret, for the response. Uh, uh, and maybe jumping into another question uh, from Wisdom again. Uh, it, it's also important to note that at the moment, um, a, a lot of studies have been done to examine the, uh, whether there is uh, additional susceptibility uh, of uh, HIV positive people to COVID. And at the moment, the evidence shows that uh, HIV positive people are not disproportionately affected by COVID. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, uh, the vulnerability, uh, although it is an underlying condition, uh, there is no demonstration yet that uh, they have a higher risk uh, of severe uh, illness or even death. So it's important that uh, the, 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 the precautions to prevent COVID 
should be followed by anybody who is HIV positive or not. Uh, and of course, even the care provided uh, is the same. But I think what needs to be noted uh, is because there is a higher likelihood that an HIV positive person will visit a health facility, uh, maybe to just pick their medicines or um, uh, to go for a lab test uh, or for any kind of follow-up, uh, it is important that uh, when they go to a place where uh, there is a higher likelihood to have cases of COVID, uh, they ensure that uh, they adhere to all the prevention uh, 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 approaches recommended. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter. And I, we, I think we can squeeze in one more question um, before the end of this session. And this question is around issues of burnout and exhaustion that make the retention of CHWs difficult. And I think we can all you know, have a, a clear picture of this in our head based on Margaret's remarks earlier of, of the additional work she's taken on. Anthony, maybe I can turn to you to how digital tools have been supporting community health workers and making sure that they have uh, the tools at their fingertips to make some of this work a little easier and, and help retain um, community health workers. Yeah, okay. One thing about how the uh, how this tool has really supported the community health worker is that as you have seen that they can be able to use the tool in the comfort of their houses to first of all do the phone screening to the household that they want to go and visit. So in, in that way, they'll be, uh, they are playing it safe uh, because they don't want to go to a household, to do a household visit to a household that has already been, uh, has already been uh, exposed, actually. So, and, uh, and also, this one, uh, it also limits them from moving around uh, uh, using also people work. It's so very tedious to them, but they can uh, be able to use the application, uh, uh, which is in their phone. And they can be able also to do their own self um, check uh, before even they go to do the household visit. So, and, uh, so now that one has really helped the community health workers to be able to uh, uh, um, to do their work uh, of the service delivered to the community. And also again, uh, calling a household to do the phone screening is actually something that takes around four to five minutes, there are not so many questions, or, not, or rather three to four minutes, it's not something which is too big, and, but we have already been able to capacitate them with the, uh, with the air team. So they are very comfortable with it and they are not even complaining. So yeah, I think around that, that's how uh, the digital tools have really been able to support the community health workers. Uh, I, I hope I've answered that question. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and one last comment on fair compensation and salaries for community health workers. Um, Dr. Peter, do you have any remarks to quickly address this and then we will close out the session? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think uh, fair compensation and, and uh, for community health workers um, has, has really gained prominence uh, and uh, the World Health Organization community health worker guidelines are clearly uh, um, indicate that uh, it is important uh, that not only sh should community health workers be compensated, but there should be clarity in their terms of reference. Uh, at Living Goods, uh, as an example, uh, in all our operational countries, uh, we have uh, always provided uh, an amount of compensation. Uh, we are not at a place where we would want that to be, uh, but there is uh, definitely recognition that uh, there is need uh, to compensate. But uh, in addition to that, and there was a question of burnout related to that, um, th there is also a tendency to expect community health workers to, to do a lot, uh, to do every you know, program that comes in, uh, just add that work to the community health workers, uh, shift all the tasks to them, uh, and yet many of them are, are doing voluntary work, and even those who may be earning do not earn much from the work that they do. Uh, so at Living Goods in particular, uh, we do uh, expect that a community health worker would commit about three hours of their day uh, to the work that we support them to do so that they can also be able, in, uh, although we do provide some compensation, uh, we think that they should be able to 
um, uh, engage in other uh, beneficial economic activities as well as other matters that they need to be. Uh, and, and at LG, we are very much uh, advocating uh, to ensure that a compensation of community health workers uh, becomes the norm uh, in every country. Great, thank you, Peter. And thank you to all the panelists who joined, Margaret and Anthony for taking time out of your days to, to facilitate this important conversation. And Tara, thank you again um, in the Global Fund Advocates Network for hosting this. I believe you'll be circulating the recording and some materials as well, the video um, and Anthony's PowerPoint. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Um, very much uh, appreciate this uh, conversation. It was very informative and interesting, and it was lovely to hear from all of you. So thank you very much. And I will definitely share a recording of the video um, and of this call and the presentations. Um, so thank you again. And um, we have another session later today and um, uh, another one tomorrow. So uh, take a look at our website, and you can find uh, more details about those sessions coming up. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for presenting. Bye. Thanks for the presentation. Bye.